and with uh, with Doc in particular too, obviously he had an integral role in a, a lot of stuff. So why why do you think he worked so well with you guys? Um, shit, I think he worked well because he had them Dre giving him the beats to write to. You know what I mean? And them beats, yeah, the beats was dope, and that you know, he was man. Doc could write his ass off too. You know what I mean? Like everything he wrote, and he got his own little style. Like if you listen to certain things, like at, at Dre, that he wrote for Dre or he wrote for E, you could tell Doc wrote that. Like I could tell, like Doc wrote that. Like he got his own little style. So I think it was easy for him to write, man. When you getting them Dre beats and it's just easy. I mean, it, for real, it's easy. It's easy. And so for you also being that. Working with Dre in, in the 80s, but then going and uh, being on the 2001 album, like how did you see the evolution of how he worked uh, back then up until like that era of what he was doing? I mean, it's, it's the same way. He was like the same way, same way, like serious. Like he got the best ears. And I used to say this back in the day, he got the best ears in the game. Like, he, to me, back in the day when we was doing our records, I used to say he could work with any artist, not just hip hop. He could do R&B, jazz, he could produce anything. I mean, his ears is that good, man. And, and so, per, I remember uh, when Colors came out, it was some rock group on the on the soundtrack that got him to mix their record. And this was like when Colors. Yeah, 88. You know what I mean? They wanted him and he went in there. I can't remember the name of the group. It was some rock group, a white rock group. And he mixed a, a record that was on the color soundtrack. I mean, his ears is like, I used to say whoever, whatever, like if you had an artist that played out, I used to say he could bring them back if he go in the studio. With him. And I'm not, I'm serious. Right. I'm dead serious, man. That dude's ears is incredible. The same way when he produced Michelle A record. Right. He had never produced no R&B record, but he made her record. So that being said, with even with J.J. Fad, because it was the Dre remix that really made it blow up, obviously. So what, were you around when that was happening? Yeah. So what, what happened, you know, from the original version, because it was Arabian Prince right. and Train, right? Right. So then going from that version to... Well, it wasn't even Train. Train didn't produce none of it. He no, didn't produce he just scratched on okay. it, that little. But you know what? I think the, even the scratch on there that could have been Dre. Okay. You know, they could just say Train, but that was Dre <laughs> that did the little in the studio. But Train was dope. But that little scratch, that was just a little simple scratch Dre gotcha, did. Gotcha, gotcha. You know what I mean? But what what did you you remember anything that was so different about that record that enabled it to happen? To the JJ Fab record. I mean, at that time you had Salt and Pepper was out. Right. Herbie Love, but. Uh, so that was like Dre's biggest, you know, the only producer out at that time. Well, you had Hank Shockley was out too, from Bomb Squad. But when he went in and did J.J. Fat, I think he was more like, he was looking at what Herbie Lovebug was doing okay. with Salt and Pepper. Gotcha. And he did his thing with them. And he wrote a lot on that stuff too. So he go in these little modes, man. But what I'm saying is he, he could do any rec, any genre of music, he could produce it. Anything, Definitely. I'm I'm convinced he can do anything. He can produce anybody. Okay, and then as for yourself, um, Exhibit and I, of course, had the open bar radio. We had you on there a couple different times, but you had to work with EA Ski with the Burn Radio Burn and yeah. everything. So for you, musically, uh, what are you working on right now? Well, right now, man, I'm kind of like chilling right now. You know, um, the last thing I did, I did something with Ski. It's a song called Fear, and me and Cube is on. That'll be dropping soon. And uh, I talked to Premier, and me and him supposed to be cooking up something. Oh, wow. So we'll see how that go. You know, that'll be a good mix. And I remember Premier said, do you want me to do like a West Coast beat? I was like, man, I want a Premier beat. I, you know, I don't want no just regular sounding West Coast beat. I want a Premier beat, and I want to try to flip that with my lyrics. and. Do it, man. Okay. You know. And then uh, I know you had also mentioned to me that you're working on a documentary. Yeah, I'm working. I'm working on a documentary, man, about myself. 
you know, my my travels through the music game. You know, from beginning to end, man. And, you know, I got a homeboy, my homeboy Tyree uh, Reed, and we are uh, putting it together right now. You know, we laying the blueprints and getting everything up to speed. So hopefully we'll start shooting that real soon. So looking back, Ren, what do you think made yourself and made NWA so powerful? Well, number one, I think um, the language. You know what I mean? Because back then, a lot of people wasn't cussing like we was cussing on records. You know what I mean? And then uh, what we was talking about, you know, fuck the police. That, you know, straight out of Compton. But I think fuck the police was the, the record that made us so powerful back then. You know what I mean? That was it. You know, nobody was saying fuck the police. And, uh, and you know, police brutality, how it was back then in the 80s, late 80s, crack game, mid 80s, crack game, how the police was just... The veteran. You know, they was fucking with everybody, you know what I mean? So that song, and not just in LA, nationwide, you know what I mean? So that, that song, you know, resonated with a lot of people everywhere. So I would say fuck the police, the language, and uh, we just didn't care. It goes a long way. <laughs> no. And then um, also, I think, too, you have uh, obviously Dre and Kube are like iconic outside of music. Right. But I think that as you and I have talked about over the years, like with Outkast giving you shouts out and different people over the years, like shouting you out. What do you what is it when the other artists talk to you that they say that they really liked about you? They tell me I'm one of their favorites. You know what I mean? Uh, that shit feel good. You know what I mean? When it come from your peers, it feel good. When it come from like top MCs in the game, that, that really feel good. You know what I mean? And you get you get mentioned by people like Andre 3000, who was dope. You know, he's dope as hell. And um, whenever I go out, if I'm out somewhere, like we do a show, and we run into people that's in the game, they like, yo, Ren, man, you know. And I'm talking about like top MCs or whatever. And he's like, yo, your shit was dope. And that just, that made me feel good because they could just be like, your shit was whack. You know what I mean? Or, you know, not even say nothing at all. You know what I mean? But when you get enough of the like dope MCs coming up to you telling you like, man, you was flowing back on them records and blah, blah, blah. That's a good feeling. Well, there it is. Yeah. All right, Ren, well, appreciate it, man. As always, yeah. I'm Soren Baker here on Unique Access, MC Ren. The business.